Serves me correctly. We got to about verse twenty. Am I right, brother Jerry? And uh, we, we kind of had to stop there. Uh, had a great discussion last week. You can have a mic if you want to, John. I just didn't want to feel left out. You can have a mic if you want to. I just didn't want to feel left Number 20, um, the Lord tells Moses and, and the people, uh, he says, Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. That word angel there is capitalized. and A lot of people reference this as, as Christ, uh, kind of before pre-incarnate, that he's going to lead the people. Uh, could it be an angel? Absolutely. But uh, I, I think it's the person of Christ. If you read on down, Verse 21, Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. So he says, my name is in him. So it almost identifies as like part of the Trinity. Does that make sense? And uh, and he gives them very clear instructions that, that beware of him, fear him, uh, obey his voice, and provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. I, I thought about those verses, and, and I... I want to go a couple different ways with it right quick. Uh, my mind took me straight to the book of Joshua. In the book of Joshua, if you remember the children of Israel, go into the promised land and they start taking over. And in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, uh, as they're fixing to start, because it's, it's, he's going to make the promise that this angel is going to foresee them through. And he said, if you, if you listen to him and obey him, he's gonna, your enemies are going to be his enemies and your uh, adversaries are going to be his adversaries. And it, and it talks about that. And I couldn't help but think, and maybe this has no correlation at all, no commentator I read made this correlation, but I couldn't help but think of these verses and, and that God was fulfilling his promise that he was going to go before them, that he was going to fight for them, he was going to be there for them. And in Joshua 5, uh, 13 through 15, it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. I couldn't help but make that correlation of of how this captain of the Lord's army was there. And, and just as he has made this promise here in, in verse 23, that I'm going to send my angel before you, for you, your enemies are going to be his enemies. I couldn't help but think that God fulfills that promise. That, that maybe this is not the same guy. I don't, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you something, that God's a fulfiller of promises. Amen. If God tells you he's going to help you, he's going to help you. If God tells you that he's for you, he's for you. If he tells you he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Man messes up sometimes. Uh, let me tell you something. I'll make promises that, that maybe I can't even keep and maybe I fail to keep. But we serve a God that will keep his promises. Amen. And uh, so I like that correlation. But I also got to thinking about in those first two verses that how he tells them that the angel, he's going to send an angel before they to, to keep them in the way and to help guide you and to help lead you and, and to give you uh, discernment rather. And I got to thinking about how that God... Uh, communed with his people differently throughout the ages and yet it's all the same. Like in the beginning, the Bible says that God walked with Adam and, and walked with Noah and walked with Enoch and, and stuff like that. But later on it was the prophets that God told the prophets and the prophets relayed the message from God to the people. We just kind of find that right here with Moses. And then later it was Jesus. Jesus actually came. And Jesus lived. 33 years he lived. And we was able to, uh, to, to get God through through the life of Jesus. And then since Jesus has ascended, then guess what we've got now? We've got the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. That God has always given his people 
guidance, if we'll heed it. God has always gave his, gave his people uh, leadership if we will heed it. So I think the same message that Moses is telling, that God's telling them right here about this angel, that you need to obey him and you need to, uh, uh, to, to heed what he's saying and provoke him not, I think that also correlates to how, the, how the, we're supposed to deal with the Holy Spirit. Y'all agree with that? Amen. How the Holy Spirit puts convictions on our heart, I think we're to act upon those convictions. Yes. Um, and I got to think about that. Obey his voice. Provoke him not. What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? Grieve not the Spirit. Uh, for he will pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee into the uh, Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canites and the Canaanites, I'm sorry, and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all those ites, and I will cut them off. And then he makes the warning that we talked about so many times over the past four or five weeks that thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them, overthrow them, and quite break down their images. God says, do not buy into their gods. Do not buy into the medicine that they're selling. He said, I am the one true God. Verse 25, he says, and you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. And there shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make thy enemies turn their backs unto thee. It says in verse 27, I will send my fear before thee. God also fulfills that promise in Joshua as well. If you remember the story of Jericho, before they overtake Jericho, you wouldn't believe how warm that place is right here. Right? Uh, before they go to take Jericho, if you remember, they send spies. In there. Joshua sends a couple spies, and they go to this lady's uh, house by the name of Rahab. And listen to what Rahab says in verse number 9 of chapter number 2. She said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Why was that? Because God made a promise right here that I will send fear before thee. They knew who these people were. And I will send, verse 28, I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before thee. And I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. God said, I've got a timetable about how I'm going to work these things out for your benefit. And I think there's a lot to be learned in that right there. God said, I'm not going to do all of this at once. Because if I do, it's going to mess up my plan. And I think a lot of times our timetable and God's timetable don't line up, does it? Amen. But God's always got our best interest in mind. Amen. Uh, he said, little by little I will drive them out from the land before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even unto the sea of the Philistines and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand. And thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in the land, lest they make thee sin against me. If thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. So God makes them all these promises. And he tells them, gives them uh, exact instruction on what to do and what, what they're to do while they're there. And, and how not to make uh, make buddies with them. And he says, verse 32, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods, and they shall not dwell in the land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. I couldn't help but think about how, how many times, can we count on both hands, how many times that God has made that warning? Do not be obsessed with their gods and their worship. And their idols. And yet we're going to find here in a few short chapters. And then throughout the rest of the Old Testament. For a 
big majority of it, that the children of Israel struggled with serving everybody else's gods and not the one true God. Why is it the things that we know that are wrong what we struggle with so much? We know it's wrong. I couldn't help but think about Paul, what he says in Romans chapter 7. He said, oh, weary man that I am. He said, I do the thing that I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. Why is it that, that we want to do that as humans, you think? Why is that? They knew the consequence of what was going to happen if they served these other people's God, yet they did it anyway. And we're the same way. We can point fingers at them, but the same thing is we understand that every time we sin, every, every action that we make has a consequence. If it's a good action... It's a good consequence most of the time. If it's a bad action or a sinful action, then it's a bad consequence. And yet we fall into it time and time again. That's right. But right now they're pumped up. Listen to what all the Lord is going to do for us. He's going to bless us. We're going to move forward. And it ain't but a few short chapters. Where Moses comes down from the mountain, and there they have made a golden calf because their leader is God. We got to be careful, guys. Because falling into sin is a whole lot easier than we think it is sometimes. Temptation can sneak upon you, and before you know it, if you give the devil an inch, he's going to take a mile. Amen. Amen. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself in sin quick. And that's the same thing that happens with these guys over and over and over again. So that sums up 23. Uh, 24, God calls Moses up on the mountain with 70 of the elders, a few other guys. Uh, we're going to read that, read the, what kind of happens there. And then chapter 25, it starts by giving instruction for the tabernacle. And the tabernacles were, uh, that, that was their, their mobile temple, pretty much. Uh, they, they, would, they would get the tabernacle. And he's going to give them instructions for it. He's going to give them instructions for the priests and how they're supposed to handle themselves. And, and while uh, we're going to learn about all those things, there's a lot of spiritual lessons that we find uh, in chapters 25 through 40. But to finish up this section right here, we're going we're to finish 24. Uh, but before we do, is it, anything stuck out to anybody in 23, that last part? He said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord hath said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and, and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which, he, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said we will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So they've got the covenant. He built an altar. He sprinkled half the blood on the altar. He sprinkled half the blood on the people, ratifying the covenant, <coughs> finalizing the covenant. We have made this covenant with God of what we're going to do, how we're going to represent ourselves. And it was safe. That there was the covenant. Verse 
verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of the sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. I read a lot of commentary on that, and, it, and every commentator that I read on and, and, and read from uh, talked about how that they didn't, they saw God, but it, they didn't see God in all of his glory. They couldn't see God in all of his glory. They couldn't behold all of that, but he, he gave them that up close and personal <laughs> time there. He dwelt with them there. Um, but then he says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables or tablets of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. Think about all these people. They were able to go part of the way up the mountain. But Moses was able to go the next step. Why is that? God called him to do it for one. But why is it that some that, that, that maybe we'll observe in our church or, or some... Uh, Maybe it's a friend or whatever. It seems like they're on the next level walk with God. Y'all ever y'all ever encounter anybody like that? That you're like, I want what they've got with God. I, I, I desire to pray like that. I desire to have that close walk. I desire to be to, to live by the Spirit and walk by the Spirit and act by the Spirit and live by the Spirit every day of my life like they do. Why why is it that, that we're on different levels? It's obedience. It's obedience. I think it all goes back to, to the verse in James where James says, if you'll draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. And I think everything in life takes work, don't y'all? And everything worth having is worth working for, everything good. And, and I think that a lot of folks work a lot harder at their spiritual walk than maybe I do sometimes. Maybe they spend more time with God in prayer. Maybe they spend more time in and, and, and just getting along with God. The, the guy Sunday morning spoke with our brother, and he talked about and just enjoying God. And, and I never really thought about it like that. Just just enjoy God, just by yourself. Maybe maybe without a devotion book. Maybe not even with scripture. Just have you ever just just enjoyed God in prayer and in meditation? I think some people are the next step because they they desire it more than we do. They take the time that they desire it more than. We I couldn't help but think as I read that, why was it that Moses was able to go further? He was that next step. And I think we should all, all have the desire to move forward with God. We, we all have a desire to move forward. I got a desire to move forward in my marriage. I got a desire to move forward in being a dad and, and, and this church and all that. But, but do we de well, spiritually, what do we desire? Do we desire to move forward with God or are we complacent and set where we're at? I think so many of us, and we hit on it Sunday when we talked about Zacharias, and maybe that he shouldn't have asked the same question that a 14 year old girl asked. Maybe he should have been further along. Why is it that we get complacent so many times? I urge you, don't get complacent in your spiritual walk. God will let you get as close to him as you want to. Right. right. If you'll draw nigh to him, he'll draw. God ain't moved one bit. If you'll draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. The Lord said to Moses, Come up unto me into the mount and be there, and I will. Give thee tablets of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister, Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Ur are with you, and if any man have any matters to do, let him come unto him. So Moses is doing what they say. They're going to go. Uh, him and his minister, him and his right hand man, him and his vice president, him and Robin, whatever you, Batman or Robin, whatever you want to call, they're going. And he leaves Aaron and Ur in charge. And it's kind of an impromptu thing that he does to Aaron and Ur. And uh, another one of those things as I read that I got to thinking about, are you ready to serve at a moment's notice? Are you ready? Aaron and Ur was able, they had a lot of responsibility at their hands. Moses was going to go up. His, eventually, we're going to learn he was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. And Aaron and Ur had to be ready 
to serve. Are you ready? I couldn't help but think about Charlie Sunday. I said, hey, Jacob going to be here through children's church. No, Jacob ain't going to be here. Immediately, here's what Charlie did. He didn't say, oh, no, what are we going to do? Charlie, can I brag on you? Is that okay? I guess. <laughs> he didn't say, oh, no, what are we going to do? Let me tell you what Charlie did. He took his Bible and he opened it up. He said, Brother Nick, I got it. I got it. He was ready to serve on a moment's notice. You know, there's opportunities we face each and every day that, that, that we can serve me. But I think a lot of times we're not ready to serve. <coughs> We've not made our minds up that we want to serve. Uh, when God opens those doors for us to serve, and I don't think, maybe they look uh, haphazard to us, but, but I don't think God works like that. God's got a plan. God's got time. And if God opens a door for you to serve, serve, be prepared. The Bible says that we're to be instant in season and out of season, always ready. The Bible says always be ready to give a report of the hope that's in you, to give a defense of the faith that you've got. Aaron and Ur are with you, and if any man... Have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Not only that, Moses was able to have confidence in Aaron and Aaron because of past experiences, I think. And well, Aaron lets him down here eventually. Don't get me wrong. But he was able to put them in charge, and I guess they were ready to act. Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And, and Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Forty days. Forty nights he was there. And like I said, from 25 to 40, we're going to learn about the tabernacle and all that. But I think that makes an important point. Where, we, where do we start in Exodus? We started with Moses. His mother had a baby. And she don't know what to do with him because there's an edict saying that you got to throw all these babies in the night. And you remember what happened? She made him a basket. And she put him in a basket. If you remember what we talked about is, is the basket that she put. Think about the time that Moses' mom put into that basket. Knowing that this basket's got to carry her child and hopefully support her child. And we, we, we caught Moses there. And we caught Moses as a child in Pharaoh's house. And we caught Moses killing the Hebrew guy. Not the Hebrew guy, but the Egyptian guy. And he, and he flees. Flees and he goes to, to Midian. And he ends up marrying a Midianite and becoming Jethro's son-in-law. And he's out there shepherding. And think about, think about all he's experienced in his life. And God appears to him in a burning bush and pretty much tells him, I've, I've got you ready for the task that, that I want you to do. And he sends him back. And, and we, when we go through Egypt and we go through all the plagues and we go through crossing the Red Sea and, we, and, and moving forward and all, and we come to this point right here that Moses is able to go up on the mount with God. Him and God. Think about the process of life. And, and we hit it on this a little bit Sunday too. But I assure you, church, that if you will let God use your situation that you're in or, or the, the situations that you face or the, or the trials and the, and the tribulations that you face, God will turn you into what he wants you to be for what he's called you to do. He did it to Moses. Now, did Moses fall? Absolutely. Did he fail? Multiple times. But God used him in a mighty, mighty, mighty way. And he prepared him his entire life. He prepared him for the next thing, then the next thing, and then the next thing. Mm -hmm. And he calls him up on the mount. And for 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible tells us in that first verse, of uh, 25, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. And he talks about the tabernacle. And well, here's what the tabernacle represented. So we talked about that God had, had, had walked with Adam, walked with Eve, walked with Enoch, walked with Noah. God was going to come down. He was going to dwell. In this tabernacle. He wanted to, to dwell among these people. And he wanted to be set up right. A place that they could come and worship him. And sacrifice to him. And he wanted to be there. He wanted the presence of God in the camp. And God thought, it, thought enough of Moses. <coughs> to call him up and to give him specific details. Of how he wanted to be represented in the camp. Because he wanted to dwell among the people. And I just.
just couldn't help but think about the process of life of Moses, about how that, that boy was his back against the wall right from the very get-go. And yet God used each situation, each situation, to move him forward for the glory of God. I hope that we'll let God do that in our lives. Amen. We, we've got that chance. We, we can either let our tribulations defeat us and overcome us, or we can use them for the glory of God. The Bible tells us that we might as well get ready. James talks about it. He says that when you encounter various trials, the word if is never mentioned. But he says, consider it joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God says, I want to use the issues that you've got in your life and the sufferings that you've got in your life to make you better for me. And we see that he did that for Moses. And I promise you, if he did it for Moses, he'll do it for you too. If you'll allow him to. That's, that's really the majority of what I've got tonight. Uh, I hate to jump ahead to 25. It's going to be a, a cool study. Uh, learning on the tabernacle and stuff like that. But through the first 24 chapters, is there anything that, that's just really, really stuck out to you in the book of Exodus? couldn't hold it back. I just got to holler. And uh, if somebody had seen me, they would have swore that I was on something. I was on something. I was on the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's right there, charge you better than anyone. Amen. We got talking to a man up in the front of Three Bears gift shop up there. Man, man just used to, used to. And uh, asked him how he did it. He said, well, I'm blessed. And he opened the door to me. Right then he opened the door. If anybody ever opens the door, you better step in there and just start. Amen. And we just about had church out there in front of three bars. Man, that fellow right there in the hammer there, 
his wife come out and kind of join him. But he, he'd had stage four cancer, and he'd beat it. And he didn't have a sign of cancer anymore. And he said, you know, I can go out now and tell people what God has done for me. Man. He said, every time I get the opportunity, I want to tell them about it. You know, tell them how good he is. And I, of course, there come my line, God is good all the time. But that, you know, you can, you, <clears throat> you sense when people are going to talk about the Lord, too. I think, <clears throat> I think they just, uh, it just seemed like that spirit combined there. Yeah. You know, and, and you know that you've got somebody that you can brag on you, God, about with each other. And it just fills your heart up. Amen. brings it like he said then you can you can come back with you know the Lord's been so good to me and you know well it was about four years <laughs> what she was saying you know, it's you know but you just have to take that opportunity Amen. because maybe something you say will help that's right hopefully that's right faith come by hearing that's right we don't tell them how they don't hear you know anybody else Verse 17 here in chapter 24 says, uh, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Can you imagine looking up and seeing that? Can you, I mean, it gives me hope here. Praise the Lord. Being, being that close to the children, we can see him working in their lives. We see him in their daily lives, but not like that. Yeah. Not that glory. Yeah. How much glory can have? love. It's not just Exodus, it's the entire Bible. But how something that was wrote so long ago, how it is so relevant to today. And the same things that they face, same things that we face. Maybe a different level, but it's the same thing. The same struggles, temptations, they face the same temptations we face. And I just, I'm so thankful for the Word of God and how relevant Amen. it is and uh, the power that's in it. It's, it is uh, sharper than a two-edged sword. And I'm thankful Anybody else before we dismiss? Uh, next week we may take a break in Exodus. I don't know. Good Lord willing, and we're gonna maybe look at the at the Christmas story uh, in a little deeper deeper fashion. It, like I said, if the Lord wills, we're gonna. Maybe that next week or the next couple weeks, and then we'll hop back in this uh, when we're done with that. But if nothing else, y'all have a blessed week. Don't forget Sunday. Don't forget Saturday. We got a we got a Christmas float. Uh, what time is the parade? Twelve. Twelve. I think parades at twelve o'clock. Line up at eleven. Parades at twelve. Are you judging the float, brother? You are? <laughs> that might be a conflict of interest. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we will have a float there. And a lot of folks worked on that. So y'all come, come see.
see that. We'll have that Saturday and then Sunday, a uh, pretty busy day as well. We'll have our, have our play at 5 o'clock, then we're going to have a fellowship meal after that at 6. And uh, invite a bunch of folks. They, these folks have worked hard and uh, more the merrier. Right, Miss Jensen? all those things in mind. Uh, was a good service Sunday. I couldn't get over it. Until right now, you know, and, uh, looking forward to Sunday. Invite somebody to come with you. Uh, you got a lot of visitors each Sunday and it's, it's a blessing to see that. Uh, I remember Brother Dave was talking about some of the visitors we've been having is like they ain't visitors no more. So that, that's a good thing. And so y'all uh, invite somebody to come with you. Looking forward to a good day in the Lord uh, Sunday. I just can't wait for that. If nothing else, I love y'all. Y'all tell somebody you love them before you lay hug their neck. Not if you got the flu, but if you if you don't, then hug their neck. And uh, hope to see y'all Sunday, brother Charlie. Will you dismiss us?